Melinda was reading this thing this morning, and I was like, I want to share with you guys. <clears throat> it says, one Sunday morning at a small southern church, a new pastor called on one of his older deacons to lead the opening prayer. The deacon stood up, bowed his head, and said, Lord, I hate buttermilk. Pastor opened one eye and wondered, where is this going? The deacon continued, Lord, I hate lard. Now, the pastor was totally perplexed. The deacon continued, Lord, I ain't too crazy about plain flour. But after you mix them all together and bake them in a hot oven, I just love biscuits. I thought of you, Mike, when I read this. And, and, and the gist of it was, Lord, help us realize that when life gets hard, when things come up that we don't like, whenever we don't understand what you're doing, what we need to do is wait and see what you're making. After you get through mixing and baking, it's probably something a little bit better than biscuits. <laughs> and I just thought that was cute because that's so true in our lives, man. We'll have stuff, we'll have stuff come up and we're like, man, I can't stand this situation. Well, I can't stand that situation. Well, I can't stand this situation. But when everything comes to the end and they all come together and you realize God worked that out for good, that out for good, and that out for good to bless me, you know, that's pretty crazy cool. So anyway... With that being said, I'm going to give my phone to my wife and put it on silent so Rob doesn't tech, try to get a hold of me and have my ducks go off like he tried to a minute ago. That's what I love about brothers, man. They will hook you up. You'll be standing up here. You'll be all nervous and paranoid about what you got to do, and all of a sudden you'll get something silly happen. And uh, thanks, man. I appreciate you. <laughs> you got to watch out for the quiet ones, man. You do. But... uh Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started here today, all right? Lord, we just thank and praise you for this opportunity to be here this morning. Worship you, Lord God, and go through your words, sing praises and song to you, Lord, and, uh, and just set aside time in our, our busy schedule to, to worship together as the bride of Christ, Lord. And uh, we just thank you for that. We just thank you for the many blessings in our lives, the people you bring into our lives, the people we get to talk to, the people that get to encourage us and we can encourage the Lord just, just thank you so much and just pray that your Holy Spirit will be here today that you'll speak through us and in us and that hearts and lives will be changed and, and uh, just pray that you help us further your kingdom Lord because that's what we want to do we want to be servants of yours Lord bond servants just thank you and praise you for it's in the name of Jesus the Christ the Son of the Most High God we pray these things Amen alright <clears throat> we're going to it's funny when you, I don't know those of you, how many people have actually tried to put a sermon together, but you'll start going on something and you're like, oh, wow, this is cool. Wow, this is cool. Wow, this is cool. I had like three and a half chapters of stuff that was just, oh, man, how am I going to make, how am I going to get all this to fit in, you know, because <laughs> it all talk, it all comes together and it's all, it's exciting. It's good stuff. You get all fired up and you're like, okay. Lord, I, I know i got to condense this because we're on a time limit, <laughs> you know? So we get to condense. He condensed it for me, which is awesome. But um, for you, it's awesome, I imagine. So I don't have you here all day. But uh, we're going we're gonna to be in a couple different places today. We're going to start out in John 8, 31 through 36. And um, then we're going to go to Romans 5. So if you want to turn your Bibles to John 8... John chapter 8, verse 31 through 36. And I'm learning from my wife to pause or say something in between to give people time to find it instead of take off. You know, it's good to have that, you know, a uh, little bit of encouragement, instruction. So, hey, wait, we got to find the chapter. Don't just start talking. So, thank you, honey. I am listening. So, John chapter 8, verse 31. When Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants. And have we ever been in bondage to anyone? How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, Whoever commits sin is slave to, of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. 
We're going to talk about being slave to sin today. You know, and in this, in this passage, Jesus said, if we commit sin, we are slaves to sin and not sons. He says, we can only be free from sin and become sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ. When we believe, we accept him into our lives to rule and reign in our lives. Because of his death, burial, and resurrection, we become sons and daughters. Prior to that, we are slave to sin. Our master is not God. And as we get into Romans 5, we'll kind of go through this a little bit more. It'll, it'll explain to us, not that we don't know, but it will explain to us how this happened and, and uh, where we go from here. So let's, let's turn to Romans chapter 5 right now. I wanted to read Romans chapter 5, 6, and 7, but I was like, well, you got to stop somewhere, <laughs> you know. So we're going to start off. I know I have this week. This is my last week, and Glenn will be back, but um, maybe we'll extend this later on. But we're going to start Romans chapter 5. We're going to read the whole chapter. And it starts out, Therefore, Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, ouch, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance and perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. <clears throat> in verse 1, it says, Through whom we have access by faith into his grace. We meaning those of us that are justified by faith, those of us who have received salvation, we are reconciled to God. Our relationship to him has been repaired. Prior to our salvation, we were the enemies of God. We were at war with him. We had no relationship with him. We were separated from him by our sin. But Jesus, when he got a hold of our hearts, and we made that conscious decision because we have that free will to decide what we're going to do. When we made that conscious decision to submit to him, then that relationship was reconciled. That relationship was repaired. We now can have conversation with, with our creator. We can now have a relationship with our creator. And he brought us peace. Peace is something we didn't have before. We're restless. We're constantly trying to figure out how to get away with something or get around something to, or to avoid conflict or to avoid um, tribulations. We didn't have peace. But once we decided to make the decision to follow the peacemaker... Then came that peace. <clears throat> Verse 2 says, Though whom we also access by faith unto this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produces perseverance. It says, By this salvation, we, know, we now have access to the grace of God. The privilege to enter into his presence and be accepted every time. You know, the Bible talks about when you go in the presence of a king, he has to put out his scepter. If he doesn't put out his scepter, you could be killed. He's not accepting you into his presence. But when he puts that scepter out, you're allowed to come into this presence. God's always got his scepter out. He's always saying, come into my, my presence. You are my child. And that's a privilege 
that's that's hard to explain. You, you can you can stand before the Father God and pour your heart out to Him anytime. There's no schedule. You don't have to make an appointment. Just any time, any place. And that's a beautiful relationship to have. We don't have that with each other, you know. And when we think about having that relationship with God, I can talk to you 24-7. But prior to that salvation, we were apart from him. The only prayers he's going to hear from us is a prayer of repentance. And from that point, that's when that relationship begins. And those blessings happen. And verse 3 and 4 is talking about the tribulations. It says, not only, not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. We can be happy in our tribulation in our hard times, knowing that our Father in heaven is disciplining us. I'm not saying we're in trouble and he's going to paddle us. He's giving us disciplines in our life, giving us strengths in our life. He's refining us. He's making us malleable. He's making us moldable. Making us into something that he's created us to be for his purpose. And in the process, purifying us. Taking away that old dross, that old... Impure, all those impurities and perfecting us. In Hebrews 12.10, oh, well, we can sw swing over and look at this. We just studied Hebrews with Glenn. Hebrews 12.10 says, when I get to it, it says, for they... in." Indeed, for a few days chastened us as it seemed best to them. But he, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. So these times of tribulation, these hard times in our lives that we all go through, being Christians, we're not immune. God uses those for our profit to refine us so that we can be partakers of his holiness I'm not saying we're perfect but he is making us holy every day going through these trials these tribulations when you're in the fire that's when all the impurities start to come out they don't come out when that when that gold is cold they just stay right in there they don't move but when it gets hot when you feel the flame you feel the fire that's when the impurities start to move. And we've all seen, we've all been through, we've all been through that fire, been through that tough time or times where we didn't know what we we're going to do. And without Jesus Christ, I can't imagine how that happens, how people deal with it. I can understand how suicide happens. I understand how all these voices come in your head that you can't defend. But with the name of Jesus, those voices may come, but in the name of Jesus, they have to leave. And that influence can't be there. So test the spirits with the name of Jesus. <laughs> Verse 5 says, Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The Holy Spirit is our hope. When you think of hope, it's not something like, well, it may or may not happen. It's something that will happen. Something that's, it's a guarantee. It's a contract. God's love being poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit will spill over onto those that we come in contact with. The feeling of the Holy Spirit's an overwhelming experience. It's, I look at it like when you have those Holy Ghost moments, you're like, man, this is awesome. This is like, it's a drug. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's almost like a drug because you're like, I want this every day. And that should, be, that should be our goal. That should be our desire is to have that communion with God where we're just filled with the Holy Spirit every day. You know, Jeremiah talking about he didn't want to preach anymore. He didn't want to go, he didn't wanna go to and, and give out <laughs> what God's asked him to give out, the messages to, to the people. He's like, man, I'm so tired of telling these people bad news constantly, you know. 
and uh, I'm tired of preaching to these people. He had zero converts, but he says, it's shut up in my bones. I got to get it out. I got to speak it. It has to come out. I want to quit, but I can't, you know? And when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, when you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes in your life, starts working in your life, and you get in the Word, you're reading the Word, you're saturating yourself in the Word, it has to come out. It has to. It can't sit in there. It's got to come out. A lot of times it'll come out when you don't even know. I've had people come up to me before and say, man, you were talking to me about this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, when? Oh, no, it was at a bike party. I had this motor at the bike party over, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't remember saying anything. But it's coming out. What's inside you comes out, good or bad, right? Verse 6, for when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, he died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We can see the love of God here. He proved it by his sacrifice when he died for us while we were still ungodly, hateful enemies of his. We spit in his face and he opens up his arms and takes the nails. He sacrificed anyway. He didn't wait until we were, were acting decent. He didn't wait until we were like, yeah, I think I like what you got to say. He didn't do that. He said, I've sacrificed for you now while you hate me. And, gave, and, and then he opens up his arms, takes the nail, sacrifices himself, gives his precious blood for those that despise him. Can't imagine doing that. He did this so we wouldn't have to, we wouldn't have to do that. We wouldn't have to have that wrath of God. He told us our worth at the cross. He said, you are worth dying for. You. I love you so much that I will give my life for you. Even though you hate me, even though you despise me, even though you spit in my face, you tell me I'm not who I am. I still love you. You are worth my life to me. And when you stop and you think about it, it just it's overwhelming to think that someone loves me so much that I'd had no respect for, I couldn't stand. But they love me so much that they gave their life for me. That's pretty heavy. You know, we've heard it a lot in our life. I think a lot of times we get immune to the fact but when we stop and think who we were and what he did and how that I don't deserve this. Why would you do this? I'm not worthy. He said, yes, you are worth it. I want you. I want a relationship with you. So much that I'm going to keep knocking on your door. I'm going to be bringing people into your life that says, I love you. I want to be with you. I want you to be with me. I want to have this relationship with you. And I'm going to continue to do that until you get to the point where you say yes and submit to God and give your life and heart and life to him. Or you say no and harden your heart. And God's a gentleman. He's not forcing the issue. He's just giving you opportunities. He's not bugging you. He's just giving you opportunities. Now, your demons are going to make you say that he's bugging you. He's like, this is annoying, man. Leave me alone. Get off my back. Because the devil's job is to take us down. He wants to destroy us because if he can get us to kill ourselves or he can get us to harden our hearts to the point where there's no way we're going to accept him, just like Pharaoh did, God hardened Pharaoh's heart after Pharaoh hardened his heart many times. Then he has that soul. Because when he looks at you and he looks at me, he sees us in the image of God. We're made in the image of God. So every time he sees a human being, 
he sees God. If he can destroy that human being, that life, and take that soul with him for eternity, he's spitting in the face of God. He's like, hey, I got another one. Ha, ha, ha. But God's going to knock. He's going to say, hey, I love you. I'm here. I want you. Why wouldn't you take that beautiful gift that I've given to you that doesn't cost you anything? Because when you think about it, we make that decision to follow Christ and accept him. It's so much easier. I don't think it's cost me anything. I mean, yeah, there's some, some friends that walked a different direction. Okay. And maybe with my personality, maybe that's the problem. I'm like, whatever, <laughs> I don't, you know, do what you got to do. Some people that might bother. I don't figure I'm out much, <laughs> you know, people might say something. I don't really care. I've never been one that really gave two hoots about what somebody had to say about me, you know, pats on the back. Yeah, they're great. Whatever. Don't matter. And those kind of sacrifices are going to happen. You know, family members may not want to talk to you. All right, whatever. You know, still got my dog, (laughs) you know, he listens sometimes. But let's get back to the, to the scripture here. And think about that first, think about that, what you are worth to him. Not what you think you're worth, but what you're worth to him. You're worth everything to him. You, God, the father loved you so much. He sent his son to do the sacrifice and Jesus submitted to him. Now that we've accepted this salvation, we no longer have to fear the wrath of God. In verse nine, much more than having now been justified. Now that you've been, you've been saved, you've been justified through Christ. You've been, your relationship has been mended by his blood we are saved from the wrath of God. When God sees sin, he has to destroy it. It's just the way it is. But he looks at us through the filter of the blood of Jesus Christ. Even though we're still in this human flesh and we continue to do things that are wrong, we have been forgiven from the beginning to the end. And he sees us through the filter of the blood of Jesus Christ. He sees us already perfected, already saved, the complete product, the finished product, the thing we don't see. The devil uses our past to condemn us. Jesus said, I paid for your past, paid in full. Tell him that. Get him out of your face. I've been been forgiven. It's been paid for. I'm cleansed. I'm redeemed. I don't have to worry about it. Don't bring that up in my mind. I don't want to hear it. Jesus said, I got it. And when the devil comes along and wants to focus us to focus on our path, what he's, or our past is what he's trying to do is take our focus off our future. Take our focus off what God's doing in our life. The doors he's opening. The opportunities he's given to us. Where God has taken us and the blessings. He's like, no, you're this. You don't deserve that. No, 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 no. I don't care. I don't care what your past is. God says, I'm not worried about, I'm not worried about the beginning of the race. I'm worried about where you're going to end it at. Where are you going to be? So forget the past. We've got today, this moment, five minutes ago, history. You know, verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. And because of his death, we're restored, we're reconciled to God. Verse 12, I'm going to read. 12 through, uh, I'll read quite a bit here probably, and then we'll go back. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, 
And thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there was no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the man of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as though, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, also, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So going back to uh, verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. It's talking about Adam. When Adam sinned, through Adam's sin, I should say, we're all sinners, and sin brings death to all that follow it. So from Adam's sin, he brought Adam's choice in the garden, his sin in the garden, his disobedience in the garden, he brought sin upon the, the world. He brought sin upon all that followed him. So from the beginning until the end, the sin is going to be there because of Adam's disobedience. And sin reigned over humanity before the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments. Because before the Ten Commandments, there was no law for you to say, um, for it to convict you in the way that that does does. Sin had no consequence in the mind of men prior to the law. They hadn't sinned the way that Adam had. Adam's was blatant disobedience to God. His sin affected all of humanity, just as Christ's sacrifice will affect all of humanity in a positive light. So you look at, you look at Adam, and he brought the sin into the world to affect every human being from creation to the end and then here comes Christ he affects the entire human race through his sacrifice just like Adam but instead of sin and death it's salvation and life Adam's sin brought death. Jesus brought life full of an abundance of, of grace and the gift of righteousness through him. No more bondage. No longer slave to sin and darkness. Now sons and daughters of the living God raised to reign with him. So no more bondage. I want to flip back to Hebrews again. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. And, um, oops, I keep flipping past it. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is evil, and release those through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. 
So there's no more bondage because in living in our sin, we are bound in our sin. There's bondage in our sin, and he set us free through his death on the cross. And released us from that bondage when we accept him as our personal savior. We're no longer slaves to sin. Let's see if I can. Uh... Colossians one thirteen. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. That's pretty awesome. That is that is overwhelming. And now as sons and daughters of the living God, there's all kinds of things that come with that. That's a different sermon. <laughs> that's the first, that's the Ephesians, first book of Ephesians, look in there, and uh, it'll tell you what's going on. And then, um, let's see, oops, let me get back to the right. I was almost going to start reading more Colossians, and that wasn't even going to be close to what we were discussing. That would have been real confusing. Rob would have laughed, though. Verse 19 says, for, by, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Many will be made righteous. That's future. Because of his sacrifice, Jesus knew that many would be made righteous because of his sacrifice, but many yet to come. People will find salvation after the fact, after his sacrifice. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounds, abounded grace abounded much more so that as sin reigned in death even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through jesus christ our lord the law brought with it the knowledge of sin it proved to us that we needed forgiveness restoration we needed the grace of god because of the light put upon our sin by the giving of the law because of this grace we can have eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus didn't have to do that. God didn't have to make that decision, but he did. And to read through this, I mean, I wanted to get into chapter 6 and chapter 7, get deeper into, into of being slaves of sin and how to be dead or how to be alive by in God. I think I, I got enough time to go into it a little bit, but it says, chapter 6, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we, who died to sin, live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death, therefore we were buried with him through baptism and, and into death? That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. This doesn't mean that our sin nature was eliminated at the cross or at the moment of our conversion or baptism. Instead, God delivered us from the power of darkness. We can overcome. Prior to, it was our default mechanism prior to salvation. It's just what we did. It was natural. 
but because of our salvation, we can overcome sin. We overcome it by when things happen, we take care of it right away. And when it keep when it comes back, tempts us again, we take care of it again. We continue to do that to the point where it has no effect upon our life. It's getting rid of bad habits. It's getting rid of old habits. It's getting rid of old ways of thinking. Getting rid of old, old ways of of acting, and doing. And it's not easy. But the more you say no, the easier it gets. The first no is the hardest. So we're not. We're not given grace. Is not giving us a license to sin. Grace has given us a way to overcome sin. Jesus said we're dead to sin. He says, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. That's powerful. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that they, that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. After the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Amen. Amen. That doesn't really need a lot of explanation. <laughs> you know, that pretty much says it. I think my point today is I just, I just want people to, to read this and realize what God did for you. If you're saved, not just take it for granted, but really look at it and understand, get a new understanding of what he did. Understand his heart when he sees you. Understand what he sees when he looks at you. You are worth dying for. You are loved, you are desired. I don't care where you're at in life, I don't care what you've done, what you think about the God, he says, right here, we just read, how much he desires you, how much he desires that relationship with you, what to what lengths he went to prove to your worth. <clears throat> it's pretty amazing. If there's anyone here today that doesn't have this grace applied to their life, doesn't have this blessed salvation that's still a slave to their sin, today's the day of salvation. Today. He's knocking right now. He's saying, I love you. You mean everything to me. I gave my life for you. You are precious to me. I mean, I have another opportunity. You never know to receive him. He's knocking. He's knocking today. We don't know what's in store. You know, as we get older, we lose a lot more friends, a lot more loved ones. We want this message to go to them. We want to, we want to hang out in heaven. I was talking to a buddy of mine yesterday, who just lost his wife a few months ago. <clears throat> he's hurting. He's bitter. He's upset still, obviously. I get it. 
I said, hey, Rod, dude. I said, um, you know she's in heaven, right? Yeah. So you know that she's basically on vacation till you get there. You know? She's with Jesus right now, hanging out, having a great time. I said, you have a, whole, you have a promise you're going to be there. How many people out here don't? Don't be upset. There's so many people walking these streets that don't have any hope of seeing anyone. Maybe hearing their screams. I don't know. They have. They don't have any promise of, of hanging out again. You're separated for a short amount of time. This life's a vapor. You know? You will be together again. That's just the way it is. You can be upset. I said, but you got stuff to do. You've got a kingdom to help build in the process. And I understand. We're all hurting. It hurts. It's not, we're, not, we're friends for years and years and years. But in the meantime, you got a bunch of people out here. They're putting in the ground that don't know Jesus, don't care to, to know Jesus. You might be the only person that can talk to them. You got to tell them. You got to give them that. That hope, you've got to give them that one last, maybe, message that Jesus loves them and that they're worthy and they're worth it. And that's our job. People are like, okay, what do, Lord, what is, what's your purpose for me? Go make disciples of me. Go tell people about me. I hear people say, well, I, don't know, I don't know what God has for me. I'm like, yeah, you don't read your Bible, obviously. You know, God says go make disciples. He'll move you around where he wants you to be. He'll put you in the spots he wants you to be in. But go make disciples. Go preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because that's what he preached. That's what he lived. That's what he did. That's our salvation. That's our hope. That's our promise. Amen. Let's pray. I appreciate you guys being attentive and listening. And uh, glad that the hecklers didn't show up today. Praise God. Well, one. <laughs> Lord, we just thank you for the time we can gather together, Lord, and just speak your word. And, and uh, Lord, we just pray that what you ha <clears throat> had for us today and got out and had touched people's hearts. And Lord, that we will realize in greater detail what you went through and what you did <clears throat> and how you feel for us and how you feel about us. We just thank you, Father God, for the sacrifice. We thank you for salvation. We're excited to spend eternity together, Lord. <clears throat> I just uh, pray for everyone that's here today, Lord, that if they don't know you, they'll know you today. And if they do know you, that they'll draw closer and closer to you today. Just thank you, Father God. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus the Christ, the Son of the Most High God. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.